Hi, my name is Marie Romagnano, founder of Healthcare Professionals for Divine Mercy. I'm so happy to present to you our educational conferences that integrate medicine, bioethics, and the spirituality of divine mercy in patient care for healthcare professionals. Because of their importance, even if you're not a medical professional, we invite you to join us. Today, I wish to summarize a presentation given by Father Mark Yaveron, an Oblate of the Virgin Mary. In this presentation, Father Mark, a former cell biologist and currently a bioethicist, discusses St. John Paul's encyclical, Veritas Splendor, or the Splendor of Truth, and Pope Francis's apostolic exhortation, Amoris Laetitia, or On the Joy of Love. Father Mark outlines his position on why he feels that there's no conflict in these two documents. Pope John Paul's encyclical deals with the fundamental questions on the moral teachings of the Church, while Pope Francis's apostolic exhortation outlines how to deal with people struggling to live the teachings of the Church. The exhortation has a remarkable tone, and it's like sitting down for a counseling session on family life with Pope Francis. In it, he quotes St. Paul, St. Thomas Aquinas, and even Martin Luther King. Pope Francis wrote, we treat effective relationships the way we treat material objects and the environment. Everything is disposable. Everyone uses and throws away, takes and breaks, exploits and squeezes to the last drop. Then goodbye, number 39. And he stated, the other person is much more than a sum of the little things that annoy me, number 113. People's actions have a negative effect even if they are unaware of it. In Veritas Splendor, St. Pope John Paul II wrote regarding God's law, when people disregard the law or are ignorant of it, whether culpably or not, our acts damage the communion of persons to the detriment of each. Number 51. Even if a person is unaware of the grievous nature of abortion, the action leaves a child dead and many wounded. Ignorance is not bliss. The three conditions for mortal sin are, number one, it's a grave matter. Number two, the person has full knowledge of the sinful situation. And number three, there is deliberate consent. St. Pope John Paul II wrote, when dealing with divorced and remarried Catholics, there are two ways to receive Holy Communion. Number one, the couple separate or number two, they remain abstinent in the relationship. Pope Francis stated that we cannot say that those living in a irregular situation are deprived of sanctifying grace, and by thinking everything is either black or white, we close off the way of grace and growth and discourage the path of sanctification which gives glory to God. Father Mark pointed out to the statement made by the Buenos Aires bishops who wrote that there might be situations where couples who cannot get an annulment and cannot live as brother and sister could receive the sacraments of reconciliation and the Eucharist. However, in the view of Father Mark, the vision of Veritas Splendor still holds and thus there is a need to walk with and accompany those who are not living in accordance with church teachings. Father Mark moves into discussing transgender issues, including the body and soul, and noted that by altering the genitals, persons do not change their sexuality. Every cell, not just sex cells, shows us to be male or female. Regarding sexual reassignment, he noted that there is an increase in suicide rates, suicide attempts, and an increased need for psychiatric inpatient care for those undergoing female to male manipulation, an increased rate of criminal convictions takes place. I invite you to listen to Father Mark Yaveron's full presentation as he offers a comprehensive, in-depth reflection on bioethics arising from the papal documents Veritas Splendor and Amoris Laetitia. Thank you.
I'm really very blessed and very thankful to be back here at this conference. I've, I've lost track. I think it's my fifth or sixth year, Marie, and it's always so good to come back, and I find that every year it gets easier to find the place. <laughs> so if you had trouble finding the place today, I just encourage you to keep coming for five or six more years. It'll get very easy. I only got lost on my way from here to the church. <laughs> I don't know, maybe you've heard the story of the priest who went to give a talk at a, a public school and he, he couldn't find the office. So he asked one of the first graders, where's the office? First grader pointed to where it was. And the first grader had never seen anyone dressed like this priest. And so he said, what are you? And the, the priest said, well, I, I'm a priest. And the kid said, well, what's a priest? And the priest thought for a minute and he said, well, a priest is somebody who helps people to get to heaven. And the kid said, you can't even find your way to the office. <laughs> How are you going to help anybody to get to heaven? <laughs> All right, so bioethics in light of Veritatis Splendor and Amoris Laetitia. So I suppose I should say a word about what those two things are, Veritatis Splendor and Amoris Laetitia. So Veritatis Splendor, in English, The Splendor of Truth, was a 1993 work of Pope St. John Paul II regarding certain fundamental questions of the church's moral teaching. So we are in the 25th anniversary year of Veritati Splendor, 2018, which is part of the reason why we're bringing it into this conference. It's a wonderful document, really, on why some things are right and other things are wrong. Why some things lead us to true happiness and other things lead us away from it. Why some actions lead to our flourishing, why some actions work against our flourishing. That's what Veritati Splendor was about, Pope St. John Paul II. Amoris Laetitia, which means the joy of love, is the much more recent document of Pope Francis, his apostolic exhortation on love in the family. Part of my reason for bringing these two things together in the same talk is that there are some people in the church who would say that there is a conflict between these two documents. There are some people who would say that. My own position is that there is no conflict between these two documents. Veritati Splendor talks about why some things are right, why other things are wrong, according to the church and according to reason. Amoris Laetitia deals with, among other things, how to deal with people pastorally who are having a hard time living that teaching in regard to family life and married life. But I see no conflict between these two things. Hopefully I can make that more clear as we move along. So I want to start out with some general points about Amoris Laetitia, Pope Francis's uh, recent document, his 2016 document. First of all, I would say there's a remarkable tone to this document. As you read it, you feel like you're sitting down with Pope Francis for a counseling session about family life. Now there's this footnote, footnote number 351. It's come to be known as the smoking footnote. Hmm? because it has to do with divorced and remarried Catholics and communion with the sacraments. That smoking footnote, as it has been called, does not come until chapter eight. So I often like to ask people, have you read the first seven chapters before getting to that footnote? In those chapters, Pope Francis quotes everyone from St. Paul to St. Thomas Aquinas to Martin Luther King to Babette's Feast. It has to be the first papal document in history to quote Babette's Feast but it's in there. He gives advice on how to correct your children, advice on sex education, even advice on how to live with your in-laws. It's all there in Amoris Laetitia. And I would say that if everyone lived the first seven chapters of the document, then the whole question of divorce and remarriage and what comes after that would be much less of an issue in the first place. So I really encourage you, if you haven't read the document, 
easiest thing to do is just to go to vatican.va. It's the Vatican's website. You can find all the documents there. It's a wonderful document to read. Now, as I started to realize when this document first came out that people were kind of going straight to this footnote, and as a moral theology teacher, very often I'd, I'd bump into people, and as soon as they found out I was a moral theology teacher, the next thing out of their mouth would be, what do you think of chapter 8 of Amoris Laetitia? Hmm? Um, I want to give a, a sampling of Pope Francis's wisdom in Amoris Laetitia. I'm just going to give you a few quotes to give you a little bit of the flavor of everything that comes before chapter 8. So Pope Francis says, we treat effective relationships the way we treat material objects and the environment. Everything is disposable, everyone uses and throws away, takes and breaks, exploits and squeezes to the last drop, then goodbye. This is a very common theme in Pope Francis's teaching. The very same mentality that says we throw away unborn children when they're inconvenient, we throw away things and trash the environment. We also throw away relationships. You know, this relationship isn't working anymore. I'm going to throw it away and get a new one. And Pope Francis laments that kind of mentality in relationships. He also says in Amoris Laetitia, we have to realize that all of us are a complex mixture of light and shadows. The other person is much more than the sum of the little things that annoy me. Isn't that great? Hmm? You know, this can happen in marriage, it can happen in family life, it can happen in religious life, where we start to look at other people as the sum of the things that annoy me. Pope Francis is reminding us that the other person is much, much more than that. He says, in regard to like the, the, the dreamlike vision that a lot of people have of the perfect relationship, it is not helpful to dream of an idyllic and perfect love needing no stimulus to grow. A celestial notion of earthly love forgets that the best is yet to come, that fine wine matures with age. Wouldn't it be great if we all looked at marriage that way, if we all looked at priesthood that way? It's like a fine wine that matures with age. Now, as I mentioned before, a lot of people skipped all of this and went right to the footnote. It's very interesting that Cardinal Schoenborn of Vienna predicted that that is exactly what would happen on April 8, 2016, when Amoris Laetitia was released. So look at what Cardinal Schoenborn said. He said, I should, however, mention that Pope Francis has described chapters four and five of Amoris Laetitia as central, not only in terms of their position, but also their content. We cannot encourage a path of fidelity and mutual self-giving without encouraging the growth, strengthening, and deepening of conjugal and family love. These two central chapters of Amoris Laetitia will probably be skipped by many people keen to arrive at the so-called hot potatoes, the critical points. And in fact, in Amoris Laetitia itself, Pope Francis basically says, take your time with this document. He says, given the rich fruits of the two-year synod process, this exhortation will treat, in different ways, a wide variety of questions. This explains its inevitable length. Consequently, I do not recommend a rushed reading of the text. Pope Francis saying, take your time with this document. Cardinal O'Malley of Boston said much the same thing. Rather than try to draw immediate conclusions from the text, we are urged to reflect upon it and to ponder patiently and carefully what the teachings will mean for the church and for her ministry to families. So when the document came out in April of 2016, I had quite a few of my students coming to me asking me, what do you think of it? Well, I quoted Pope Francis and I quoted Cardinal O'Malley and I told them, I'm not going to say anything about it until I've read it three times. It was very good because it was already April, so that got me through to the end of the school year. <laughs> Then over the summer, I read it three times. When I came back in the fall, I had to start saying something about the more controversial parts of Amoris Laetitia. Now, to enter into this, I'm going to start with a quote from Veritati Splendor, Pope St. John Paul II's 
document of 25 years ago. This is a wonderful quote that says something very important about the church's overall moral vision, the church's vision of the moral life. Let's look at this key quote from Pope St. John Paul II. He says, by submitting to the common law, common law here means God's law as it is revealed through the church and through our human reason, our acts build up the true communion of persons and by God's grace practice charity which binds everything together in perfect harmony. When, on the contrary, we disregard the law or even are merely ignorant of it, whether culpably or not, our acts damage the communion of persons to the detriment of each. Okay, so the church would say that if I disregard God's law, or even if I'm just ignorant of it, even if I'm ignorant not through my own fault, and I go ahead and do things that violate God's law, my acts are still going to damage myself and other people. I think we all know that this is true on some level. I was thinking the other day of everything that's happened with uh, the concussion controversy in football and even in soccer. You know, for years and years, for decades, people didn't really know that that kind of contact could cause concussions and that people would be having such trouble later on in life because of those concussions. So they were ignorant of that, and yet they were still being hurt by it, weren't they? Even though they were ignorant, what they were doing was still hurting them. And the church would say that this is very true of the church's moral teaching as well. Take something like abortion. Even if a person does not know that there is anything wrong with it, and even if they don't know, let's just say for the sake of their argument, uh, for the sake of argument, that it's not their fault that they don't know. Hmm? They are still going to be hurt by it if they do it. Hmm? The child ends up just as dead. The mother still ends up being the mother of a dead child. Hmm? The abortion hurts other people and it hurts society, even if they are ignorant of the church's teaching. Okay? It's a very, very important principle in the church's teaching that what you don't know can hurt you. Ignorance is not bliss. Hmm? When we violate God's law, even unknowingly, we do things that are hurtful to ourselves and hurtful to other people. So I'd like to illustrate this with a picture. I showed a picture very much like this last year. Here you are on the path of life trying to get to your final goal, which is heaven just like that priest said to that first grader. Hopefully priests are helping you to get to heaven, right? And the church is gonna teach that there are some kinds of actions that fall short of the happiness, of the perfection, of the flourishing that we are called to, simply because of the kind of action that they are, right? So murder, for example, and suicide, they violate a very basic human good of human life. Adultery, for example, violates the good of marriage and family life. Slander violates the good of human communication, okay? So, even if this person doesn't realize that these things are wrong, by doing them, they still hurt themselves and they hurt other people. It becomes harder for them to get here, which is where we all want to get in the end, okay? So, this is what Pope John Paul II is saying when he says, when we disregard the law or even are merely ignorant of it, whether culpably or not, our acts damage the communion of persons to the detriment of each. Now, if you notice on that picture, one of the things that's here under evil actions is adultery. The church has always taught that that is evil. The church still teaches that it's evil. The church will always teach that that is evil. And so, for example, if you have a validly married couple, and if they divorce, and if one of them gets married to someone else, let's say in the presence of a justice of the peace in the state of Massachusetts, the church would say that they are now in a state of adultery. And that teaching goes back to the original teaching of Jesus in Luke 16. Jesus said, 
Everyone who divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery, and the one who marries a woman divorced from her husband commits adultery. Okay, so this is the original teaching of Jesus. And so the question has always come up, especially to us priests who are working, let's say, in parishes. If you have a divorced and remarried couple, how do you deal with them pastorally? How do you get them involved in the life of the church? Can they confess? Can they go to communion, etc.? And John Paul II, way back in the 1980s, gave a very clear answer to that kind of question. And this is what he said. Reconciliation, and he's talking about divorced and remarried Catholics here. Reconciliation in the sacrament of penance, which would open the way to the Eucharist, can only be granted to those who, repenting of having broken the sign of the covenant and of fidelity to Christ, are sincerely ready to undertake a way of life that is no longer in contradiction to the indissolubility of marriage. Pope John Paul II says, this means in practice that when, for serious reasons, such as, for example, the children's upbringing, a man and a woman cannot satisfy the obligation to separate, they take on themselves the duty to live in complete continence, that is, by abstinence from the acts proper to married couples. So, Pope St. John Paul II is saying, back in the 1980s, that if you have a validly married couple, if they divorce, and if one of them remarries, there's only two ways that that person can receive communion. One way is if they separate from their new, let's say, civilly married spouse. The other way is if they can't separate, they need to live in complete continence. In other words, they need to commit themselves to living as brother and sister rather than as husband and wife. Okay, I hope that's clear. And that was very clear teaching of Pope St. John Paul II. And I will say that when I was a uh, priest in a parish, I had a very small number of couples who were willing to commit themselves to this. In other words, they had divorced, they had remarried outside of the church. For one reason or another, they did not or could not get an annulment. And they committed themselves to living as brother and sister until such a time that as their marital situation could be resolved. Okay? Hopefully that's clear. If it's not clear, then please, you can write down a question and we can deal with it later. Now, Pope Francis in Amoris Laetitia says this. Because of forms of conditioning and mitigating factors, it is possible that in an objective situation of sin, which may not be subjectively culpable, in other words, blameworthy, or fully such, a person can be living in God's grace, can love, and can also grow in the life of grace and charity while receiving the church's help to this end. And then he foots, footnotes down here, this is what he says in the footnote, in certain cases, this can include the help of the sacraments. I would also point out that the Eucharist is not a prize for the perfect, but a powerful medicine and nourishment for the weak. And so what does this mean? This is what a lot of people were coming up to me and, and asking me about, especially in 2016. What does this mean exactly? Well, I would say that one of the things that Pope Francis is calling attention to is a very clear teaching of the Catechism of the Catholic Church, CCC. This is a, sort of a, an ancient teaching of the church that in order for mortal sin to be present, there has to be three things. First of all, it has to be something that is seriously wrong. A person has to do an action that's seriously wrong. They have to have full knowledge that it's wrong. And they have to have deliberate consent. Those are the traditional three things that need to be there in order for a person to be in mortal sin. And so Pope Francis is saying that it's possible to be in, ob in an objective situation of sin where there is something gravely evil and yet, the person could be living in God's grace, perhaps because they lack sufficient knowledge or they lack deliberate consent. So he goes on in Amoris Laetitia and says, for an adequate understanding of the possibility and need of special discernment in certain irregular situations, and here he's talking about irregular 
marital situations, one thing must always be taken into account, lest anyone think that the demands of the gospel are in any way being compromised. The church possesses a solid body of reflection concerning mitigating factors and situations. Hence, Pope Francis says, it can no longer simply be said that all those in any irregular situation are living in a state of mortal sin and are deprived of sanctifying grace. Now, when you read this, and you see it can no longer simply be said, that kind of suggests that Pope Francis has a change in mind, doesn't it? If you're saying it can no longer be said that people in any irregular situation are living in a state of mortal sin. Pope Francis goes on. Because a lot of people then at this point want to know, well, which divorced and remarried people are you talking about? Which ones perhaps can receive communion now who couldn't receive communion before? Hmm? This is what he says. If we consider the immense variety of concrete situations such as those I have mentioned, it is understandable that neither the synod nor this exhortation could be expected to provide a new set of general rules, canonical in nature and applicable to all cases. What is possible is simply a renewed encouragement to undertake a responsible, personal, and pastoral discernment of particular cases. In other words, Pope Francis is saying, rather clearly in Amoris Laetitia, I am not going to give you specific guidelines about this. Hmm? What I'm calling for, he's saying, is a renewed encouragement to undertake a responsible, personal, and pastoral discernment of particular cases. Now, this um, distresses a lot of people because especially in pastoral situations, you want clear guidelines, right? You want guidelines to be clear as possible. But Pope Francis says, again in Amoris Laetitia, by thinking that everything is black and white, we sometimes close off the way of grace and of growth and discourage paths of sanctification which give glory to God. So I would say this, Pope Francis is not black or white, I would not say that he's gray. I would say that he's colorful. Hmm? <laughs> you know, he's Argentinian. It's going to be hard to tie him down the way you could kind of tie down his two predecessors. So what you then had were various bishops, various groups of bishops interpreting Amoris Laetitia and giving pastoral guidelines to the priests in their parishes. One such group were the bishops of Buenos Aires, Argentina. So they came out with a document called Basic Criteria for the Application of Amoris Laetitia. This was a little bit later in 2016. And this is what they said in that document. When the, when the concrete circumstances of a couple make it feasible, especially when both are Christians with a walk of faith, by the way, this is my translation from the original Spanish, the determination to live in continence can be proposed, right? Just the way John Paul II said. They're saying the determination to live as brother and sister can be proposed. Amoris Laetitia does not ignore the difficulties of this option and leaves open the possibility of approaching the sacrament of reconciliation when one fails in this resolution. This, again, is nothing new. Even John Paul II, back in the 1980s, would say that if a couple commits themselves to living as brother and sister, and let's say they fall once, they fall into sin once. They could certainly confess, rededicate themselves to living as brother and sister, and move on. All right? So, so far, there's nothing different here in what the Buenos Aires bishops have said. Here comes a big however from their document. They go on and say, in other more complicated circumstances, and when a declaration of nullity could not be obtained, when there's some reason why an annulment cannot be obtained for some reason, the option mentioned of living as brother and sister may not be feasible. However, a road of discernment is equally possible. If one comes to know that in a concrete case there are limitations that mitigate responsibility and culpability, particularly when a person considers that they would fall into another fault harming the children of the new union, Amoris Laetitia opens the possibility of access to the sacraments of reconciliation and the Eucharist 
These, in turn, dispose the person to continue maturing and growing with the strength of grace. So here we have the Buenos Aires bishops, I would say, clearly going beyond what John Paul II said in the 1980s, because they envision a situation where a couple cannot get an annulment. For some reason, they feel that they cannot commit themselves to living as brother and sister. And yet they are saying, at least in some cases, these people might still be able to go to the Sacrament of Reconciliation and receive the Eucharist. The Buenos Aires bishops sent this document to Pope Francis for him to look at it. Pope Francis read it, and he sent a letter back to the Buenos Aires bishops. And this is what he said. I received the document of the pastoral region of Buenos Aires, Criterios Básicos para la Aplicación del Capítulo 8 de Amoris Laetitia. Thank you very much for having sent it to me, and I congratulate you for the work you have undertaken, a true example of the accompaniment of priests. The document is very good and explains exactly the sense of Chapter 8 of Amoris Laetitia. There are no other interpretations, Pope Francis says, and I am sure that it will do much good. May the Lord repay you for this effort of pastoral charity. So the Pope clearly agreeing with what the Buenos Aires bishops said in their document, thanking them for it, and Pope Francis also asked, and, and this has happened, that both the document of the Buenos Aires bishops and his response would be placed in the Acta Apostolica Sedis, which is the official record of Vatican documents, okay? So, now I'm gonna summarize and hopefully say a few things that are clear. If you're a little confused at this point, hopefully this will clarify things. First of all, I would say, read the whole thing, not just the controversial part, because it is a wonderful document. I would say, it's clear at this point, the door is open for more divorced and remarried couples to receive communion, though it is not entirely clear to whom. The theological justification for such couples to receive communion is that they may be in an objective situation of adultery without being guilty of mortal sin. The decision to receive communion should only be made within a process of pastoral accompaniment by a priest, and this is a quote from Amoris Laetitia, according to the teaching of the church and the guidelines of the bishop. In other words, Pope Francis does not want married couples deciding on their own that they can go to communion if they've been divorced and remarried. He doesn't want priests just acting like a loose cannon, saying you can go to communion even though you're divorced and remarried. He says, according to the teachings of the church and the guidelines of the bishop. Now, of course, we've had different bishops and different groups of bishops saying slightly different things. And so, Here's my kind of summary question. Given the absence of precise guidelines from Pope Francis and the diverse responses of bishops, are we dealing with a decentralization of the decision about who can receive communion? That's kind of what I'm thinking at this point, that Pope Francis's mindset may be sort of a decentralization to the local diocese, to the local bishops, in regard to who can receive communion. Now, many people are very uncomfortable with that. I had a very bright student in class raise his hand once when I said this, and he said, what's the difference between decentralization and relativism? It's a great question, isn't it? Are we saying that something is a, a mortal sin in one diocese and not a mortal sin in another diocese, right? Here's the point I would make. I would say that relativism is the danger of decentralization but decentralization can also save you from relativism. And here's what I mean by that. I was stationed in the Philippines for nine years. And I have to say that in nine years in the Philippines, I did not meet a single person who had gotten an annulment. They just do it much less over there. I'm not sure why. I think part of it has to do with the fact that it's a third world country. I mean, bishops are occupied just with keeping their people alive, giving them basic pastoral care, trying to feed a country that's having a hard time feeding itself, right? Also, if you're going to get an annulment, the original spouse has to be contacted. I've traveled around the Philippines. There's over 7,000 islands in the Philippines. Can you imagine trying to contact the original spouse? Sometimes very, very, very difficult. 
So let's suppose I run into somebody in one of the provinces in the Philippines. They start talking to me about their marital situation, and it becomes very clear to me that if they were living in Boston, they could probably get an annulment within six months. Okay? Perhaps a sort of decentralization of who can receive communion will allow the same person who could receive communion in Boston after getting an annulment to receive communion in the Philippines even if they can't get an annulment. Okay? That's kind of what I'm thinking. You know, I put that out there uh, ready to be corrected if Pope Francis or some higher authority should correct me, but I kind of wonder if maybe we're dealing with a decentralization of the decision about who can receive communion. So, to bring this home now to our conference, what difference does Amoris Laetitia make for the church's moral teaching in general, including bioethics? Because there are some people out there saying that this is some kind of alternative moral viewpoint, and maybe Veritati Splendor doesn't apply anymore. Well, I would say Amoris Laetitia does not make much of a difference at all in regard to the church's moral teaching in general, including bioethics. Amoris Laetitia has to do, among other things, with how to deal with people who are having a hard time living up to that teaching. It does not change the teaching itself, right? So I would say that the vision of Veritati Splendor still holds. That has not changed. So adultery is still here. It's still an evil action. It's still wrong, okay? I think Pope Francis emphasizes, what he's emphasizing is the need for us to walk with people who are not living in accordance with the church's teaching. And part of that accompaniment involves teaching them the whole truth about right and wrong, the whole truth about marriage and family life, teaching them that truth which is for their own benefit. Because if they are ignorant of it, they are ignorant of it to their own peril. Okay, now I'm going to shift gears. <laughs> this picture was taken with my flip phone. So before I shift gears and deal with a particular bioethical issue in order to kind of um, exemplify this, I'm wondering, Marie, maybe we could just stretch for a minute or something, okay? Just don't, don't go anywhere. Maybe you can just stretch for a minute before we shift gears, okay? You also have a moment if you want to jot down a question, uh, you can do that. Okay, 15 seconds. As my students know, when I say a minute, I mean a minute. Okay. Big change of topic, and I'm going to take an example of a single kind of field of bioethical issues. Why am I picking this issue among all the ones that I could pick? First of all, I would say people found it very helpful when I gave this talk, at, or at least part of this talk, at a similar conference in Cleveland last fall. Also, I think it's an example of what Pope John Paul II's very tidy splendor says. In other words, it's an example of how ignorance of the truth can hurt you. There is so much uh, lack of knowledge around the area of transgender issues, and it's really hurting a lot of people. And it's also an example of a teaching that Pope Francis has clearly reaffirmed in his writing and in his speaking. So here's a quote from Pope Francis last October. He was talking about 
the whole confusion about sex, in particular, man and woman. This is what he says. The recent proposal to advance the dignity of a person by radically eliminating sexual difference and as a result, our understanding of man and woman, hopefully you all realize that this is really afoot in our society, the effort to remove or eliminate sexual difference. Pope Francis says, oops, excuse me. And as a result, our understanding of man and woman is not right, he says. The, utop the utopia of the neuter, Pope Francis says, eliminates both human dignity and sexual distinctiveness and the personal nature of the generation of new life. The biological and psychological manipulation of sexual difference, which biomedical technology can now make appear as a simple matter of personal choice, which it is not, runs the risk of dismantling the energy source that feeds the covenant between man and woman, making it creative and fruitful. So Pope Francis clearly reaffirming the teaching that our sexuality, male or female, is not something that is chosen and that can be manipulated or manufactured or modified. It's something that's given to us by God, or if you don't want to say God, it's something that's given to us by nature. Nature and nature's God. Now let's look at what the world has been saying about this. Uh, DSM, as you may know, is the guidebook for psychiatric practice in medicine. And DSM-5 is the fifth edition of it. And this is what DSM-5 says. The distress that may accompany the incongruence between one's experienced or expressed gender and one's assigned gender. Okay, that's the definition of gender dysphoria, according to DSM-5. Although not all individuals will experience distress as a result of such incongruence, many are distressed if the desired physical interventions by means of hormones and or surgery are not available. So notice the, the language that is used here. DSM talks about expressed gender versus assigned gender. Notice the implication here and using this language, instead of talking about biological gender or biological sex, the implication is that these people were assigned the wrong gender at birth. Right? That's the implication that's made here. It says that not all individuals will experience distress. Right? So in other words, as opposed to calling it a disorder, if a man thinks he's a woman or a woman thinks she's a man, it's only a problem if they experience distress because of it. That's what the DSM is saying. It says many are distressed if the desired physical interventions by means of hormones and our surgery are not available. The implication here is that gender dysphoria is really our fault. It's society's fault for resisting sex change interventions or not making them more available. Okay? So there's a huge shift here uh, as compared with previous editions of the DSM. In other words, what this is saying is that a man who thinks he's a woman and wants to have his genitals removed may well be normal and healthy, according to DSM-5. The American Psychological Association says something similar. A non-binary, in other words, not just two, a non-binary understanding of gender is fundamental to the provision of affirmative care for transgender and gender non-conforming people. Psychologists are encouraged to adapt or modify their understanding of gender, broadening the range of variation viewed as healthy and normative. So in other words, the American Psychological Association is saying that if you're a psychologist, you are not going to be able to treat folks well if you think that human beings are either male or female. Let's contrast this with the wisdom that the church gives us in regard to the sexes. First thing I would point out here is a very basic principle of just what the church understands about the human person is that the human person is an incarnate soul, not a body occupied by a soul. In other words, the soul is not in the body like a pilot is in a ship or a ghost in a machine. We are incarnated souls. Uh, 
Pope Benedict had a wonderful uh, phrase for this. He said, spirit and matter compenetrate. I love that word, compenetrate. Have you ever cooked a dessert and it's actually better the second day? Because all the ingredients have had time to compenetrate. Although you probably didn't say that over the phone to your friend, right? Well, spirit and matter, body and soul, compenetrate. Our body is shot through with soul. It's not like the soul is in a particular place in our body. We are incarnated souls. Souls or spirits by themselves are neither male nor female. The easiest way to see this is if you think about the angels, who are pure spirits. In the scriptures, some angels are given male or female names. But properly speaking, angels are not either male or female because they are pure spirit. The body is what determines the sex of the human person. If you want to know what the sex of the person is, you look to the body. You know, one cannot speak of being male or female except as manifested through the body. The person's sexual identity is reflected in the person's biology. The human soul is directly infused by God before birth. So in other words, the human body, the human body comes from pre-existing things, right? It comes from a sperm, it comes from an ovum, etc. But the human soul is directly given by God. It is directly infused by God. And that means there's no room for error. So even if we could imagine a female soul occupying a male body, or vice versa, that would mean that God had made a mistake by infusing the wrong kind of soul into the person. And it seems to me that that is blasphemous, and it's also disrespectful and insulting to the person, himself or herself. Contemporary gender theory leads to atheism. I think this is a very important point. In other words, in atheism, what we have today is a systematic denial of the very first things that are revealed in scripture, that God created the heavens and the earth. Atheism today says, no, he didn't that God created us male and female. Contemporary gender theory says, no, he didn't. It's chosen by us. It's determined by us. That God decides what's good and what's evil. Atheism says, no, we decide what's good and what's evil. So a very basic denial of the most fundamental things that are revealed in the scripture. Okay. Pope Francis, again, reaffirms the church's way of thinking in Laudato Si, his great encyclical on the environment. He says, the acceptance of our bodies as God's gift is vital for welcoming and accepting the entire world as a gift from the Father and our common home. Whereas thinking that we enjoy absolute power over our own bodies turns, often subtly, into thinking that we enjoy absolute power over creation. Learning to accept our body, to care for it, and to respect its fullest meaning is an essential element of any genuine human ecology. So Pope Francis making a connection between respecting our own nature, okay, including our sexual nature, and respecting nature in the larger sense in regard to the environment. In doing this, he is following what Benedict XVI said before him. Benedict XVI said this, there is an ecology of man. Man, too, has a nature that he must respect and that he cannot manipulate at will, which is what sexual reassignment, quote unquote, does. Man is not merely self-creating freedom. Man does not create himself. He is intellect and will, but he is also nature, and his will is rightly ordered if he respects his nature, listens to it, and accepts himself for who he is as one who did not create himself. In this way, and in no other, is true human freedom fulfilled. Benedict XVI also said this, the manipulation of nature, which we deplore today where our environment is concerned, now becomes man's fundamental choice where he himself is concerned. You know, we've learned that if we try to manipulate nature at will, nature meaning the environment here, 
nature will come back and bite us, right? You know, we throw mercury into the rivers, the mercury stays there for generations, the fish eat the mercury, the fish get sick, and now future generations can't go to that river and fish. So by trying to manipulate nature at will, nature comes back and bites us. And Pope Benedict the Sixteenth is saying basically the same thing. If we try to manipulate our own nature, it's going to come back and bite us. We're going to have all kinds of problems with ourselves if we don't accept ourselves, accept our nature for what it is, including our sexual nature given to us as male or female, and if we try to manipulate it as, at will. I think that this confusion is exacerbated by our legal system. This is a quote from Obergefell versus Hodges, the Supreme Court decision that legalized same-sex marriage three years ago. The Constitution promises liberty to all within its reach, a liberty that includes certain specific rights that allow persons within a lawful realm to define and express their identity. Now, isn't that something? I have a constitutional right to define my identity as long as I don't break the law. That's what the Supreme Court has said. You know? um, I have a constitutional right to define myself as a five foot two Chinese woman. <laughs> as long as I don't break any laws. Now, Justice Scalia, late Justice Scalia, went ballistic on this in responding in his dissent to the Supreme Court's argument. This is what he said. If even as the price to be paid for a fifth vote, I ever joined an opinion for the court that began, the Constitution promises liberty to all within its reach, a liberty that includes certain specific rights that allow persons within a lawful realm to define and express their identity, I would hide my head in a bag. The Supreme Court of the United States has descended from the disciplined legal reasoning of John Marshall and Joseph Story to the mystical aphorisms of the fortune cookie. Mm -hmm. you know, Justice Scalia affirming that there are aspects of our identity that we cannot define. Mm -hmm. No matter what the law says, I cannot define my race or my age or my height or my gender, etc. All right, now suppose people say, well, that's a religious view of the sexes, and you can't impose your religious views on other people. Mm -hmm. Well, let's just look at some science here. This was what my doctorate was in before I became a priest. So every cell, this is a quote from a very good article in Ethics and Medics, every cell, not just the sex cells, shows us to be male or female. Altering the genitals does nothing to change the real sex of the person. If you're male, it's not just your sperm that has a Y chromosome. Every cell in your body that has a nucleus has a Y chromosome in it. Every cell in your body tells you that you're a man, just the way every cell in your body tells you that you have Down syndrome, if you have Down syndrome. That's just science, right? So I would say that the burden of proof would be on the medical profession, on the American Psychological Association, on the American Psychiatric Association, to show beyond a shadow of a doubt that people who think they're the other sex are better off if you mutilate their body. Seems to me that the burden of proof should really be on them. It shouldn't be something that's just assumed by society. Now, let's look at a particular study that was done in Sweden, because I would argue that not only has the medical profession not proven that people are better off with sexual reassignment, but I would say that there's good evidence to the contrary. This was a big study that was done in Sweden. They studied people from 1973 to 2003. They followed up 10 years after they had quote unquote sexual reassignment treatment. And this is what they found. The overall mortality for sex reassigned persons was higher during follow up. So there was an adjusted hazard rate of 2.8. Okay, so that means there was roughly three times the rate of mortality in sexually reassigned people compared to the general population. Then for controls of the same birth sex, particularly death from suicide, adjusted hazard rate 19 times as high. And with the confidence interval somewhere between 6 and 63 times the rate of suicide 
with sex, sex, sex reassigned people as compared with the general population. Sex reassigned persons also had an increased risk for suicide attempts, roughly five times as high, and psychiatric inpatient care, roughly three times as high. Comparisons with controls matched on reassigned sex yielded similar results. So in other words, they did controls where they, where they compared sex reassigned people both to people who were the same sex before reassignment and people who were the same sex after reassignment. And they got similar results. And they even found that at least in females to males, they had a higher risk for criminal convictions than their respective birth sex controls. Now you think that people would look at this and say, geez, you know, maybe we should really think twice before doing sexual reassignment on people. Let's look at what the authors of that paper say. Persons with transsexualism after sex reassignment have considerably higher risks for mortality, suicidal behavior, and psychiatric morbidity. They admit that, as compared to the general population. Our findings suggest that sex reassignment, although alleviating gender dysphoria, may not suffice as treatment for transsexualism and should inspire improved psychiatric and somatic care after sex reassignment for this patient group. So, in other words, we really need to take better care of these people after we mutilate them. That's their conclusion. They go on. In other words, the results should not be interpreted such as sex reassignment per se increases morbidity and mortality. Things might have been even worse without sex reassignment. As an analogy, they say, similar studies have found increased somatic morbidity, suicide rate, and overall mortality for patients treated for bipolar disorder and schizophrenia. This is important information, but it does not follow that mood stabilizing treatment or antipsychotic treatment is the culprit. Now this actually makes sense from a scientific viewpoint. What they're saying is, um, okay, even if the results don't prove that sex reassignment hurts these people, okay, um, well, okay, let's put it this way. This is what I would say. I would make two points here. Even if the results don't prove that sexual reassignment hurts these people, it's far from clear that it helps them. Okay, that's the first thing I would say. Second thing I would say is if the original condition is what's to blame, because right? that's what they're saying here. They're saying, look, if you have a person with bipolar disorder, you treat the person. That person is still going to do worse than the general population, not because of the treatment, but because of the original disorder. Right? So they are saying that if a person has uh, gender, identi gender identity disorder and they undergo sex reassignment and they have a worse outcome than the general population, that's not necessarily because of the sex reassignment. It's probably due to the original condition. And so my question would be is if it's due to the original condition of thinking that you're a woman in a man's body or vice versa, then why are we not classifying it as a disorder? That's the $64,000 question, I think. We certainly classify bipolar and schizophrenia as a disorder. So if the original condition of thinking I'm a man in a woman's body or a woman in a man's body is responsible for the bad final outcome, why aren't we calling that condition a disorder? Why are we encouraging people to come out, you know, and treating transsexualism as a condition that's neutral or even good? Hmm? Now some doctors are telling the truth. Here's a great uh, quote from an article by Paul McHugh. He says, most young boys and girls who come seeking sex reassignment come with psychosocial issues, conflicts over the prospects, expectations, and roles that they sense are attached to their given sex, and presume that sex reassignment will ease or resolve them. In fact, he says, gender dysphoria belongs in the family of similarly disordered assumptions about the body such as anorexia nervosa and body dysmorphic disorder. Its treatment should not be directed at the body as with surgery and hormones, any more than one treats obesity-fearing anorexic patients with liposuction. I think that's a great analogy. You know, treating a man who thinks he's a woman with surgery is like treating an anorexic patient with liposuction. 
The real treatment, he says, should strive to correct the false problematic nature of the assumption and to resolve the psychosocial conflicts provoking it. So in other words, pretend your adult sister or your niece came to you weighing 70 pounds, even though they're a full-grown adult, and they said, I want to get liposuction. What would you say? Would you say, well, I really can't judge you? Hmm? Or would you try to help them to see that although they think that they are overweight, they in fact, in reality, are not? So in other words, Dr. McHugh is saying, you have to help the person on the level of the mind and not engage in a futile attempt to try to change their body. Support for the view that gender identity, gender identity disorder is indeed a disorder. The body reverts to the original phenotype if sex reassignment treatment is discontinued. In other words, if you stop giving the person the hormones that you're giving them to reassign them, to reassign their sex, they tend to return to what they always were. Treatment provides a change that is more cosmetic than real. You can give the person makeshift genitals of the other sex, for instance, but they're not going to have normal reproductive function. The evidence for an improved outcome for the reassigned patient is equivocal at best, as we've seen in that Swedish study. And so his conclusion, physical change from one gender to another is not medically possible. It simply is not medically possible. And I think there's a real charade going on as society you know, pretends that it is possible. Here's a great uh, quote from uh, a high school student in Connecticut. In 2016, she won the 100-meter dash for the state of Connecticut, Class M track and field championships. 2017, she had to compete against a boy who identified himself as a girl, and she came in second. This boy, who believes that he's a girl, came in first in, those race, in that race. And so they identified the girl who came in second, and they interviewed her after the race, and this is what she said. I can't really say what I want to say, but there's not much I can do about it. Hmm? So she realized that she can't say what she wanted to say. What she wanted to say is, I was beaten by a boy who thinks he's a girl. Hmm? But she realized, even at her young age, that you are not allowed to say that anymore. Hmm? Uh, the boy that she lost to had yet to undergo sex reassignment surgery or any hormonal treatment at all. He was simply a boy who decided to identify himself as a girl, was allowed to compete in the track and field championships, and finished first in the 100-meter dash. Okay. In the interest of finishing close to on time here, I'm just going to abbreviate what I was going to say about intersex. Uh, there is so-called intersex people. I think a better term would be people who are sexually ambiguous at birth. Okay. There are some people who at birth, it's hard to tell whether they're male or female. And the word intersex has been used to describe them. I do not think that's a good term. It's not that they're between the sexes, it's just that it's hard to identify which sex they are at birth. It happens in 0.018% of cases, about one out of every 5,000 births. So 90, over 99.9% .9 of people are clearly either male or female at birth. Some, it's hard to tell whether they're male or female. And I'll just point out that the church has no problem with hormonal or surgical procedures to make the body of a sexually ambiguous person more consonant with the sex that they really are. Okay, the church has no problem with that. So I think in our minds we want to have clear two different things. Males or females who think that they're the other sex and who want to be sexually reassigned versus people who are sexually ambiguous at birth. Okay, those are two distinct things. Church has no problem with hormonal or surgical procedures to make the body of a sexually ambiguous person more consonant with the sex that they truly are. Okay. And so, just to finish with this quote that we've seen before, when we disregard the law or even are merely ignorant of it, whether culpably or not, our acts damage the communion of persons to the detriment of each. There is so much ignorance about this issue of transgender, you know, the, the whole transgender field, what people don't know can really hurt them. Hmm? But Pope Francis would want us to accompany those people. He would want us to love them. 
He would want us to lead them to the full truth about God and about nature, the truth that they need in order to truly flourish and to have true happiness. Let us pray. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the gift of our lives, the gift of our nature, uh, the gift of our sexuality given to us by you through nature. And we pray that all those who are in confusion um, about whether they were created male or female by you, that they may find wise counsel that will help them to accept uh, the sex that they truly are. And I pray for all those here present that you may guide our minds and our hearts and our souls so that we may lead others to the truth that will set them free. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay. Thank you all.